Hi guys, Casey Talks EV here, and today we're going to be talking about Android Auto, or AA for short. So Android Auto is effectively the way to extend your whatever's on your phone onto your infotainment system, or well, car screen, I guess. And the way it does it is in a very car-friendly fashion. So what you get is larger icons, larger text in order to be able to see it from much further away as well as it restricts certain applications and it unifies certain interfaces on those applications in order to make life a lot easier to navigate and to make sure that you are focusing on the road. So this video is definitely intended for people who don't use Android Auto already or haven't used it before rather than the people who've used it for years. So um, in that case then, if you have been already using it, I don't think I'm gonna go over too many points which are which you don't already know. However, in this video, we're going to be going through, first of all, initial setup and first time connection, as well as certain cables. But in terms of the Android Auto or AA sections, we're gonna go through navigation. So what's available in terms of the applications and how to use them. We're going to be going over music and podcast control, as well as showing you kind of the unified interface that you get across all your apps. We're also going to go over the phone function, which can be very useful. And finally, we're going to just have a quick overview of the Google Assistant. Anyway, let's get started. So in terms of initial setup and installation, uh, there are a couple things to note. So first of all, in terms of device choice, I've got a Samsung Galaxy Note 9 and a Huawei P40 Pro. So as far as I'm aware, any Android device above Android 6 should be compatible with Android Auto. In terms of cable choices, anecdotally, I've not really experienced any issues with using, I guess, lower quality or cheaper cables off Amazon. I normally just buy the cheapest five packs or multi-pack USB-C cables that you can buy on Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description if you are looking um, for one that'll work. With respect to the MG ZS EV in particular, you have to connect it to the right-hand USB port at the bottom of the transmission or gear selector. Uh, you probably should look at your individual car's user manual if you don't have a ZS EV. Uh, I am just going to put another footnote, I guess. the With Huawei devices in particular, I would highly recommend not to ha buy a Huawei device if you are looking to use, either, first of all, Google services in general, but in particular Android Auto for this video. I've had to, for my P40 Pro, had to sideload applications onto my P40 Pro in order to use Google services like things like YouTube, the Play Store, Android Auto. And therefore it just becomes a lot more difficult in order for you to, if you don't have any experience in that at all, it's just really not worth the hassle. In terms of initial setup, so as you can see here, I've got my Galaxy Note 9. Uh, it doesn't need to be in full screen, but I will just basically go over the installation. So plug your cable into the USB port that allows Android Auto connectivity and get your USB-C cable. So the only major difference that when in terms of cables that you need to look out for is whether your device uses USB-C. So in my case, both the Note 9 and the P40 Pro US, uh, use USB-C cables. This is, I'll probably overlay it here, but it is a reversible connector. I know some devices still use micro USB, which I'll also overlay here. But as long as you buy the correct cable um, for that particular device, you're all well and good. So in terms of connection, literally all you have to do is connect to the USB-C port. That's normal on my device. And now what it's going to do is ask whether I'm stopped. So I am stopped in this case. Uh, put in park. Uh, it will then go through sort of allowing certain permissions because especially on more recent Android um, updates, they have made it very clear that they need you to know what permissions they're taking. And you will have to accept them in order to use all the features that AA has. And finally, we are in. So... That's basically first time setup. All you have to do is enable all your permissions. So the first section that we'll go over is navigation. So in terms of navigation, the um, I don't really like using the built-in sat-nav. This is because I just find it a lot less responsive and a bit less intuitive compared to what I'm already used to using. For example, Google Maps and Waze, which are the two apps that we are going to be talking about today. The the thing is, is that Google doesn't actually allow third party navigation applications to be used. For example, I know full well that uh, TomTom has an extremely good Android application 
and um, especially if you're already used to the old Tom Toms, um, I guess back in the day. But as a result, you can only use maps and Waze. Waze was actually bought by Google in 2018, hence why it's not considered third party. If you've already used Google Maps before, um, to be honest with you, uh, it's basically exactly the same thing. Um, you know, pretty much all all there really is to it is you can't really do pinch to zoom. You have to use um, the slider, um, you know, to zoom in and out. You can also search destinations via a keyboard, but only when you're in park. Once you're in drive, you have to only use voice commands. So, for example, last week um, I went to the EV Festival at the British Motor Museum. So, tell you what, let's navigate to there. Oh, but uh, just one other thing. Uh, it does say incognito mode is on. The reason why is because obviously I use this phone for um, sort of general navigation things and it does have a history. And for some reason, I think it's a software bug, but it won't let me delete every single one of them. So that's the only reason why. Uh, normally it won't show incognito mode is on unless if you enable it. But yeah, let's say, um, well, first of all, let's try the text search, I guess. So British Motor Museum. Yep, so Lightthorn Heath in Warwick. And as you can see, it basically works exactly British the same Motor Museum may be closed by the time you arrive. I mean, I am filming this at 10 past 11 at night, so that's not that surprising. However, as you can see, this is turn by turn directions. The only thing that you do have to remember is if you want it always centered in the direction that you're heading, just always click recenter if it's not already there. Uh, it also works in the same way in terms of voice control. So if we say navigate to the British Motor Museum. Navigating to British Motor Museum. As you can see, it works in exactly the same way and it works absolutely fine. So in terms of ways uh, we can show you on there, you can set default navigation applications. So you can either set ways or Google Maps as your default. As far as I'm aware, what that does is, for example, if you just tell it to navigate to it and you're on this screen and you're not on the particular app screen, then it will default obviously to the one. I think I've got Google Maps as my default one. But if we load up Waze instead, what we're gonna do is it works in basically the same way. And I guess that one, and it works in exactly the same way. So press go and it will calculate a route. Let's go. There we go. And again, if you want to use voice control Navigate to the British Motor Museum. Okay, handing you over to Waze. And as you can see, because I'm actually on that particular app, it will use that one as a default. So um, I'm guessing that it's this one instead. And as you can see, go. And it will actually calculate the Let's route go. exactly the same way. Now, the now in terms of the advantages, if I were to summarize those advantages and disadvantages of using Google Maps and Waze, I'd say that Google Maps in terms of a door to door navigation tool is exceptionally good. And the one thing I've noticed is Google Maps seems to be a lot better at going in at first of all, finding directions. And if I said a particular door number, it would actually be a lot more intuitive in terms of that it will find that door number and finally where it places me at my destination it's almost bang on right you know within maybe a neighbor or the next door neighbor it's basically bang on whereas Waze seems to be a lot less accurate in terms of that however by far the best feature about Waze is the crowdsourcing of information so as you can see here you can actually make public reports which gets relayed over to other Waze users. So you police, traffic, accident, etc. Obviously I'm not going to do one because I'm stationary at the moment. However, this is very important in terms of being able to know a lot faster than actually any other traffic service I've come across, especially from the likes of TomTom Tom and even Google Maps actually, and be able to react to it quicker has actually saved me nearly probably hours in terms of a journey. And by far even though Google Maps is slowly getting that crowdsourcing of data feature, Waze definitely still is much better compared to Google Maps. 
And that's why, to be honest, there's not really any reason why you can't have both installed. So for my day-to-day -day deliveries, I use Google Maps. And for my much longer distance journeys, I'm normally liking it, uh, likening to Waze. But yeah, uh, that's just a quick overview of what you can do. Two important features or in tips that I have noticed at least in terms of my utilization of Google Maps, especially. So what I've noticed is with, so I've just unplugged my phone for the time being. With Google Maps, you can do certain things like, you, obviously you can add multiple stops. So for example, if I, let's say I needed to go pick up someone in Sheffield before I w went to the EV festival. So let's say I add a stop um, and then I wanna go to the British Motor Museum in Warwick. And let's say I wanna come back to my location as well. Effectively, what you can then do is you can press finish and then navigate. The best feature I found by far is that what you can then do is you can plug in your device. And as you can see here, it actually loads up navigation onto um, Android Auto and it works absolutely fine. So this has become very useful when I've done, for example, a multi-drop delivery. You know, I have two or three places to go to. I just plug in all the details, plug in my phone and I'm all ready to go. You can also add multiple destinations via Google Maps. However, there's a particular knack to doing it, especially if you want to designate which one's your first, second, third stop. So uh, let's try this again with the example of the British Motor Museum. Navigate to the British Motor Museum. Navigating to British Motor Museum. But if I want to add Sheffield again, for example, what it will then do is it will make Sheffield the first one. So it always prioritizes the last thing you say is the first stop effectively. Navigate to Sheffield. Navigating to Sheffield. But as you can see from the destination page, what it's done is it's added Sheffield and the British Mo uh, first, but the British Motor Museum second. But this also works for even more stops. So let's say I need to go pick up someone in Doncaster. Navigate to Doncaster. Navigating to Doncaster. Now what it's done in this case is it's added Doncaster as the first stop, Sheffield as a second, and the British Motor Museum as the third. So this is just one thing to know. I mean, to be honest, I do use this. And once you kind of get used to it, it is fairly intuitive, to be honest, but once you get used to it, so that's navigation sorted. So in terms of music and podcasts and news, um, the basically, if you already use a music streaming service such as Spotify and Amazon Music or um, Google Play Music, for example, they normally already have an optimized Android auto form of it. The only thing I can really say in this case is if you're going to choose between Amazon Music and Spotify, there is a serious bug with Amazon Music in that if you ask Google Assistant or Android Auto for a particular song, it just won't work. Whereas with Spotify, it does. Now, what I've noticed, and I actually tried this with a friend uh, a week ago, is that Amazon Music, for some reason, will work with certain artists, but won't work with others. And um, there's not really a particular pattern as to why it won't work with others. However, Spotify works absolutely no problem at all whatsoever. In fact, actually, um, I will show you now. So I've got Spotify up. As you can see, here's sort of the, the interface so you can access your own library. So this is playlist, albums, artists, whatever. You can even um, check, ch just sort of browse for a particular playlist as well as it does have certain radio stations as well, as far as I'm aware. Um, but yeah, it works basically exactly the same that Spotify works on your phone at least. But in terms of voice commands as well, use Spotify to play Ed Sheeran. Sure, asking Spotify to play Ed Sheeran. And actually it works very well. So um, in terms of Amazon Music, unfortunately, I don't have a subscription anymore. I assume they're probably going to fix that eventually. But but anyway, I swapped over to Spotify for that reason, actually. Um, in terms of podcasts, I like using Google Podcasts. Uh, I will have a small little plug for Electric Dreams. So I think I was on that particular, ep um, that particular episode of Electric Dreams, actually. Uh, that's the Yorkshire EV Club's uh, official sort of podcast. As well as I really like Gary... Um, Gary C's 
EV Musings podcast as well, and I've been listening to that. And it does work in exactly the same way. In fact, actually, I will... I hope Gary C won't mind. But as you can see, it works like so. Uh, the one thing that you will notice is the, as I said, there is definitely a unified interface in terms of how it looks from app to app. It really does make it a lot easier to work with, especially when you should be paying attention to the road. And having a unified interface means it's a lot easier to kind of go by almost touch, basically, to go um, navigate through the menus. And finally, one interesting feature is the news app. I'm not quite sure exactly where you can pick which news sources you get. However, it is definitely an interesting selection. Here's the latest news. The headlines from BBC News at 9.43pm today. Let's see, it has BBC News, Sky News, uh, CNBC. Um, so I'm not quite sure exactly where he's getting it from, but obviously it's quite nice if you don't want to wait till on the hour for your news. But yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of sort of entertainment. Um, the only other thing else also is obviously if you do want to listen to the radio, uh, you can. Um, you know, that's not too much of a problem. I mean, I'll show you. But... I will turn it down. So I'm on DAB radio. And let's go back into Android Auto. And as you can see, you can hear it. So, but yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of entertainment. So the phone function is fairly self-explanatory, really. Um, so you can use contacts. You can even dial a number. Yeah, it, it is a little bit delayed. And that makes it a bit of a pain if you are trying to do that while driving. Um, which of course I've never, I've never done that. Um, but yeah, but that's fairly self-explanatory. However, you can also use um, the voice control. The one thing that I will also say is, in, with respect to messaging, you can ask uh, the Google system message, and it will either use SMS or WhatsApp. Uh, another thing that I've also noticed as well is if you have Messenger or Facebook Messenger installed on your device. You can't initiate a uh, message to someone using that. However, you can definitely reply to a message because it will come up on your notifications. Um, I'm not quite sure why. I assume at some point it will probably be a feature. However, that's just one more thing to know, I guess. In terms of the phone, it's fairly self-explanatory. You can go through your contacts and it works in basically the same way. You can even access your voicemail. But yeah, that's the phone and messaging covered. And finally, in, with respect to Google Assistant, you can basically ask it almost anything that you would actually ask um, Google Assistant on your phone anyway. So it doesn't necessarily have to be driving related. For example, I can even ask it to do calculations. What's 24 times eight? 24 by eight is 192. Um, you know, you can, I guess if you really wanted to. How high is Mount Everest? Mount Everest is about 8,848 metres high. And as you can see, it works just the same way as the Google Assistant. All you've got to do is remember to press the Assistant button, which, first of all, you can either do via this function. And as long as this comes up, then it works absolutely fine. But also on things like your steering wheel, so on the ZS EV, it's on the right-hand side underneath the arrow keys. Um, if you press that. Hi, Google. Hello. For tips on what you can say, turn on the microphone and say, help. So as I, as I told you, it's fairly self-explanatory. You just need to know either that you can use the microphone or you can use the particular button that is on your steering wheel or it's probably maybe elsewhere actually in your car. But yeah, um, that's pretty much it. So basically, we've gone through sort of the four main areas of Android Auto that you can use as well as first time setup. If you found this video helpful, please um, like the video. If not, um, you know, if you didn't like the video, please dislike it if you want. And uh, I'll talk to you later.